And closer to home, police say a fire was set to cover up the massacre of six people in an East Harlem housing project. Two men are being questioned, and as Pablo Guzman reports, neighbors of the victims are puzzled over their deaths. They had no reason to believe it was something more. There wasn't much smoke, and the first people they found were still alive. But as they brought people out and cleared the smoke, they quickly found this was no simple fire. The Spanish Harlem section of New York City is one that needs no introduction. Like many other locations in the city, it's one with a very long and detailed history. A long list of pivotal moments that led to the Spanish Harlem that we have today. Whether it be the food, shopping, or festivities during the summer, one thing's for sure is that there's something for everyone in Spanish Harlem. You can find yourself in Spanish Harlem walking down the street and see all the artwork that's covering the walls. Each one of those pieces tells a very interesting story. Now, some parts of Spanish Harlem's history can be very hard to revisit, but before we jump into the main story, let's take a quick look at how we got the Spanish Harlem that we have today. The area of East Harlem, also known as Spanish Harlem, El Barrio, is located north of 96th Street from 5th Avenue to the East River. El Barrio stands for the neighborhood, and the area, while known to be home to many different cultures now, was once home to Native Americans, Germans, and Irish families, many of those families looking for change. It was also where many Italians would migrate and start new beginnings. In fact, before being widely known as El Barrio, before the Lower East Side and the Bronx, Parts of Harlem were known as the original Little Italy, or known as Italian Harlem. As early as the 1890s, many Italian families migrated to New York City, attempting to escape the harsh economic climate in Italy. They took the long trip to New York City with hopes for opportunity and searching for homes for their families. From 96 to 125th on the east side, every block was filled with Italian culture, since the residents in the area wanted to feel like they were home. From the food, to the music, to the way everyday life was lived there, East Harlem could have easily been mistaken for Southern Italy, since Italians brought all of that culture with them. It wasn't always easy. Living conditions weren't the best, and most of the buildings were ran down with families having to work with what they had. Sometimes, many family members cramming into small apartments. For some families, staying in New York City wasn't always the plan. But by the 1920s, there would be more than 100,000 Italians living in East Harlem. Throughout that time, as the Italian population continued to grow, small numbers of Puerto Ricans would also begin to migrate to New York City, all throughout the Great Migration and prior. They began to migrate to the Big Apple as they sought asylum from the Spanish-American War of 1898. After the war ended, many more Rican families would continue to make the move, since there were more opportunities for work with better pay. But between the 40s and 50s, after the Second World War, the number of Puerto Ricans headed to the Big Apple would surge. Names like Fiorello LaGuardia, the mayor of New York from 1934 to 1946, and Congressman Vito Marcantonio would lead to much of Italian Harlem being demolished to make room for urban renewal, resulting in many Italians leaving and relocating to other parts of the city. Throughout this, Spanish Harlem was growing. Much like the Italians before them, Puerto Ricans made Harlem their home and brought all the culture from the island with them. New York would often be referred to as the island within a city. The music, the food, the overall way of life in Spanish Harlem was a reminder of things back home. While the area had no shortage of beauty and the area continued to evolve, the greater Harlem had many obstacles to overcome. Obstacles like opiates and other drugs making their way into the neighborhoods, heroin being a huge part of it. The use of heroin between the 50s and 70s would prove to be detrimental to the health of many. Entire families would be destroyed and the addiction couldn't be shaken most times. Gang activity is how those drugs began to make it into Harlem, with Italian gangs who had ties to the Mafia running heroin in East Harlem and the Bronx. Tensions would rise between different groups, setting a different tone. Italians, Blacks, and Puerto Ricans would start to have a hard time coexisting, something that many of us have seen depicted for decades in movies like West Side Story and A Bronx Tale, a very hectic and trying time in the city. Later on, throughout the 60s and 70s, Blacks and Puerto Ricans would join forces and fight the gentrification that was on the way, stopping the process in its tracks. Many programs would be created to try and help the youth and families in the community. Although many challenges were ahead for the residents of East Harlem and Harlem in general, the rich culture just couldn't be ignored. A huge part of that culture was the music. When it came to music, the 80s saw the rise of freestyle music, a form of electric dance that would burst some of the genre's biggest names, a few of them being from none other than El Barrio. The genre was huge among Puerto Ricans and Italians in the city. 
walk down any block in East Harlem or the Bronx in the late 80s and early 90s, and you can hear the sounds of hip hop, salsa, and freestyle blasting out of apartment windows, passing cars, or people with boomboxes just hanging on the block passing the time. Artists like Lisette Melendez, Cynthia, and Mark Anthony, who got his start in freestyle before becoming a huge salsa artist, all hail from Spanish Harlem. So many sounds were starting to become popular at the time that residents of Spanish Harlem needed somewhere to get their music, and they knew exactly where to go. They'd head over to Casa Latina, located at 151 East 116th Street. Now, there were other record stores in the area, but none would stand the test of time quite like Casa Latina. The store was purchased by a man named Alfonso Rubio in 1969. Alfonso's daughter would take over the business when Alfonso passed away in 1978, leaving her and her husband Vicente Barreiro in charge. Vicente and Christine met on the dance floor of a salsa club and were together ever since. Vicente was from Spain and moved to New York City, spending a great portion of his life in El Barrio. To Vicente, the sounds of salsa were like a breath of fresh air. He felt it was the greatest music he had ever heard. He could talk to people for hours on end about salsa and other Latin music. The location drew the attention of many salseros, athletes, and other celebrities who would often stop in. One of the well-known celebs who would often come by to make vinyl purchases was Matt Dillon. Many don't know that Matt Dillon is an avid collector of old records. He'd often come in and buy music by Cuban orchestras. Marlon Brando and Andy Garcia are a few others who were known to make purchases from Casa Latina, just highlighting how popular the location was. Sadly, Vicente is no longer with us. He passed away in June of 2023, and Casa Latina Music closed his doors for good in 2022, leaving behind nothing but good memories and leaving many in the community brokenhearted, a huge part of El Barrio's long and rich history. Record shops were just a small reason the neighborhood felt so rich with culture. Virtually everything in the area was designed to cater to those in the community. You had El Banco de Ponce, where those with a language barrier could be sure they'd get everything they needed if they made a trip to the bank. You also had La Marqueta, where many would travel to El Barrio because they knew that this was the only place they'd be able to find certain ingredients. During the weekends, many would travel from out of state to shop on 116th Street because the area was like a hub for the Latino community. While there, they'd stop in at record stores, talk music, and bring home the records they knew they couldn't find anywhere else. Very reminiscent of Sikulu Shange with the record shack on the west side of Harlem. If you're doing something as simple as walking from one block to the next in El Barrio, you'll begin to notice all the street art that cover a lot of the walls. Look a little closer, and those murals all tell fascinating stories. From a Tito Puente mural to the Spirit of Harlem mural on 104th and Lex, the images here are just as important to the residents as the neighborhood itself. Graffiti was always a big part of the culture in the area. Over on 106th and Park, you have the Graffiti Hall of Fame, created by community activist Ray Stingray Rodriguez, meant to be a spot where graph artists could visit and perfect their techniques, at a time when graffiti art was becoming brighter, bolder, and more complex. If you visit El Barrio today, it's home to many other cultures becoming an even bigger melting pot. People still visit from all over, whether it be for the restaurants or for shopping. If you were to ever find yourself in El Barrio in early June, you notice that the Puerto Rican pride is at an all-time high. That's because on the second Sunday of June every year, Ricans from all over the world would gather to attend the annual Puerto Rican Day Parade. The first ever parade was held on Sunday, April 13, 1958, in none other than El Barrio. At the time, the Puerto Rican Parade was replacing the former Hispanic Day Parade. The city found a new location for the parade along Fifth Avenue, where it's been going ever since. Every year on Saturday, the day before the parade, the streets of Spanish Harlem are flooded with Puerto Rican flags, families, food, drinks, and anything else you could think of that makes you feel like you're back on the island. This is thanks to the annual Puerto Rican festival held every year on 116th Street, where you'll catch performances, food vendors, contests, dancing, and so much more. For the New York-born Puerto Ricans like myself, also known as New Yorkans, attending the parade and festival are as common as going to school or the park. The culture for many is heavily ingrained since a young age, and you'll see many passing that along to the newer generations, keeping the spirit of Puerto Rico and its significant ties to New York City very much alive. Of course, there's a lot more history when it comes to El Barrio and the many people who have come and gone over the decades. The talented people, the iconic spots that a lot of residents of East Harlem were raised on. But some of that history isn't as easy to discuss or revisit because sometimes the past is tied to horrifying moments. And in May of 1993, one of those moments will leave residents of Spanish Harlem terrified, in disbelief, and grieving for years to come. On today's episode of Evil Intentions, this is The Jealous Boyfriend, the story of the Spanish Harlem Massacre. 
332 East is located on 115th Street between 1st and 2nd Avenue in Spanish Harlem. The building is one of 18 that make up the Jefferson Houses. The Jefferson Houses are home to nearly 4,000 residents, many having lived there for many decades. Like the other NYCHA complexes, most of the apartments that make up the Jefferson Houses were filled with families, residents with similar backgrounds coexisting, making it through the times. In New York City, in a lot of cases, it isn't uncommon for people to spend most of their lives in the projects if that's where they were raised. Now anyone who was raised in the projects will tell you it isn't for everyone. From young, we're exposed to a certain way of life that others may not understand, certain living conditions that others may not have to deal with. Whether it be no hot water, your grandmother having to boil water over and over for the family to bathe, the broken elevators during those hot summer days, or the altercations that often occur that you could easily find yourself in the middle of, there are plenty of reasons some may want to stay far away. But paired with the long list of hardships that can come with being raised in the projects are what many feel are some of the best memories. The moment that familiar melody of Mr. Softy rang and made its way to kids' ears, meaning them warmer days were right around the corner. The children who would play in the local parks would become familiar with one another as some of the best friendships and memories are created. A community where a lot of the families could relate. On a day-to-day -day basis, despite what people may say about the projects, what you'll find here is exactly what you'd find anywhere else. Families just trying to live, parents going to and from work, children on their way to school, the local mom and pop shops opening for business to make ends. Maria Rodriguez and her family resided at 332 East 115th. They were just starting to get used to things in the neighborhood. Maria was 27 years old and a caring mother to her three children, 18-month-old Linda, 5-year-old Jennifer, and 10-year-old Billy. Maria had just moved into the Jefferson houses in January of 1993. Prior to that, her and her children were residents of the Metro North houses down on East 100th Street. She lived there for three years, and her children, Jennifer and Billy, went to school nearby at PS 109 on East 99th Street. Billy was in the fourth grade, and his sister Jennifer was in kindergarten. Living so close to the children's school was very convenient for Maria, but when she had a chance to move to 115th Street, she jumped at the opportunity, because anyone who's ever lived in the projects knows how much of a nightmare those waiting lists can be. Besides, it meant her having a bigger place with more rooms for her and the children. When the family moved to 115th, Billy was ecstatic. He couldn't stop telling his teacher and his friends about his new apartment and how much bigger it was. He had his own room now and he couldn't be happier. Billy was described as a bright and very intelligent 10 year old. Classmates and teachers had nothing but positive things to say about him. He was always involved in class activities, had an animated personality, and he always treated everyone with respect. It was clear to everyone that he had been raised well. Billy showed a big interest in art and wanted to be a cartoonist. One of his teachers would help get him into the school's animators club, where he'd be free to explore his talents. His teacher was sure to let him know that if he wanted to pursue an art career and learn the business side of things, he'd have to continue doing well in school. Billy was perfectly fine with that. One drawing by Billy shows what papers originally called a monster with hairy arms. The X on the belt and the claws tell me that this is more than likely Billy drawing Wolverine of the X-Men. In journal entries that Billy made for class, he expressed how much he liked his friends. He spoke of wanting to do nice things for them and also spoke about the love he had for his cousins. Last but not least, he talked about his father, also named Billy, being his hero for taking care of him and his sisters. Billy would often take care of his little sister Jennifer whenever Maria was overwhelmed with chores or baby Linda. He watched over little Jennifer and loved being a big brother. He would leave class on most days when school was done and he would run down to the kindergarten class Jennifer was a part of so they could go home together. At just 10 years old, Billy, like his siblings, was happy and had his whole life ahead of him. Maria and Billy Sr., Billy Jr. and Jennifer's father, had long been divorced, but had a mutual respect for one another and a mutual love for their children, despite the both of them having moved on. Maria's youngest child, Linda, was fathered by a different man who'd been living in Puerto Rico. Maria, just 27 years old, was from the islands herself. She came from the town of Yabucoa, located in the southeastern corner of Puerto Rico. She came to New York City with her mother at the age of five. Maria was described by those who knew her as a caring and loving woman. 
She was an active member of an East Harlem social club called Los Angeles. She was a cheerleader for the club's softball team. Maria had a vibrant personality and loved to dance, often visiting the Upper West Side Studio 84, a popular dance spot at the time. She was also known to be a great cook. She became a part of the women's committee for the social club and would often cook for their games. Maria was a great mother to her children. Neighbors who'd often see Maria and her kids always said the family was polite and would always greet their neighbors, with Maria always displaying her big smile. She had just gotten her GED and was looking forward to some positive changes she wanted to make for her and her children. Her moving to this new location on 115th was step one of that process. She was a little bit stressed due to the long walk she would now have to take in the morning from 115th to 99th Street, where her children's school was. She would have to take the long walk with baby Linda as well, but still, she was happy to do it, making sure her kids arrived safely. She applied for school bus passes for the kids so they could take the train or bus. This would maybe make things a little bit easier for her. Whatever the case was, Maria was trying her best, and she tried to smile her way through the rough patches. But there was much more going on behind that smile than people thought, and over time, it would have become very clear that Maria was struggling with a very serious problem, her current boyfriend. At some point in 1991, after having her last child, Linda, Maria would begin dating a man by the name of Ramon Concepcion. Ramon worked at Yankee Steel Products as a mechanic, and those who knew him stated that they knew him as a hard worker, as someone who was always friendly. But for those who'd witnessed the relationship between Ramon and Maria, it was clear that this man had a much darker, more temperamental side to him. Some referred to him as a quote, jealous maniac. Things definitely weren't as great as they seemed. At the Metro North houses where Maria and her family moved from and lived for three years, neighbors recalled moments of tension and violence in the home. A next door neighbor would tell authorities that Ramon would frequently beat Maria. People heard the fights, the screams. Many knew about the shouting and arguing in the streets and in the home. On one occasion, while defending herself from an attack, Ramon took a knife and cut Maria, causing her hands to bleed. She ran out of the apartment screaming for help. In yet another attack, Maria had to be hospitalized because Ramon kicked her in the chest so hard. This type of thing happened often, unfortunately, especially if there was liquor involved. Many spoke of the times the couple would get into very heated disputes that sometimes ended violently. During their volatile two-year relationship, police were called to their home a total of four times, but Maria or her family never followed up by pressing charges. The children saw it all, and on a daily basis. In fact, one of the phone calls made to police was made by Maria's son, Billy. He frantically knocked on a neighbor's door at 4 a.m., desperate to call police to get help for his mother during a huge fight, something a child should never have to do. Maria's mother, Bienvenida, and her boyfriend, Rufino Lopez, had moved into Maria's apartment at 332 East when their apartment on 116th caught fire. The house was now full. Bienvenida and Rufino would soon witness the violent moments between Maria and Ramon, but there wasn't much they could do about it. Things getting heated and Maria yelling at Ramon through the window when he left was something they heard and saw often. The couple fell into this very unhealthy love-hate cycle of constant fights and makeups, but it didn't change that things were getting much worse for Maria day by day, and she was a clear victim of both physical and mental abuse. Maria had finally grown so tired of this treatment that she found it in herself to break up with Ramon, something she had tried before but found herself going back. This time, she meant it though. She didn't want to live her life like this anymore. Ramon wasn't happy with the decision and he was still coming over to the house. And soon after, Ramon's rage and one phone call would lead to carnage at the Jefferson houses. Those who were close to Maria and those who lived near had unfortunately grown used to the fights. They had an on-again, off-again relationship that always ended in abuse. But the events that took place on May 1st of 1993 would be just about the most cruel that Spanish Harlem had ever seen. That Saturday in Spanish Harlem was like any other. The streets were active due to the pleasant weather that day, sunny to partly cloudy in the high 70s. As the sun would begin to set, the temperature dropped to the low 50s in the evening. Some people were starting to return home, but before the day would come to a close, there would be a huge argument in apartment 2D of 332 East, the home of Maria Rodriguez. The argument began around 7 p.m. when Maria made a phone call. She called the father of baby Linda, who resided in Puerto Rico. It's unknown what the phone call was about, but it would change everything. The fact that Maria was really done with him and wanted to move on with her life didn't sit well with Ramon. His obsession with Maria was stronger than any love he might have had. According to reports, as the argument intensified, Ramon and Maria would begin fighting, with Ramon then beginning to beat Maria. 
After beginning to attack her, he would take an 18-inch carving knife with a wooden handle and began to savagely stab Maria as she tried to defend herself. She was stabbed in the back multiple times. When she fell to the ground, Ramon would wrap what might have been an electrical cord around her neck and began choking the life out of her, strangling her in a matter of minutes in the master bedroom of the home. After realizing what he had just done, Ramon decided to take a nap. After he woke up a short time later, he would set his sights on Maria's mother, Bienvenida. It's unclear if Bienvenida was in the home when Maria was attacked, but it's clear that Ramon had the same animosity toward her. He would begin to savagely beat her as well, before also choking the life out of her. She was then thrown on the bed, right next to her deceased daughter. It was said that while he took Bienvenida's life, the children were in the home, and Billy tried to defend his grandmother. Ramon would savagely beat Billy, inflicting fatal blows to his body and head, resulting in a fractured skull and severe brain injuries. He was also choked at full force as Ramon wrapped an electrical cord around his neck and pulled as hard as he could. It was clear from the ligature marks on his neck along with the other horrifying injuries that the attack was relentless. He then took Billy's body and threw him on the bed as well, along with his deceased mother and grandmother. He was nowhere near finished. He would then direct his attention to five-year-old Jennifer. The attack on her was equally vicious. She was beaten so badly that she had critical injuries to the head, the torso, and tearing in her kidney and liver. She was also choked with an electrical cord, but the cause of death was said to be an abdominal hemorrhage, which means the beating caused her to bleed internally. Ramon would continue his slaughter, now directing his attention to 18-month-old baby Linda. The baby lay defenseless in her crib. Ramon found a tennis racket and beat baby Linda all over her small body, causing internal bleeding, a torn liver, and torn kidney. After baby Linda drew her last breath, Ramon would find himself standing in the middle of apartment 2D, covered in blood. He was now in the home alone, with five dead bodies, but he couldn't care less. He watched some television as if nothing had happened. It was starting to get late and he was getting tired, so he went back to sleep. On Sunday morning, Ramon would wake up to the slaughter he had carried out just a few hours earlier. Surprisingly, nobody had been alerted to the carnage. Ramon decided that he wanted to get out of the house. He would make his way to Yankee Stadium, just 15 minutes away. He bought a ticket and caught the Sunday evening game, the Yankees versus the Mariners. The Yankees won that night, 3-2. While Maria Rodriguez and her family lay in their home, slowly decomposing, Ramon was in Yankee Stadium, cheering on the Bronx Bombers, like nothing ever happened. When the game was over, he made his way back to 332 East 115th. When he entered the home, to his surprise, he was confronted by Bienvenida's boyfriend, Rufino. Rufino had recently arrived at the home to find the walls covered in blood and his loved ones dead. Ramon exacted the same amount of viciousness on him, stabbing Rufino multiple times in his back, his chest, and his head. The stabbings cut through his liver, his kidney, and his lung. Ramon had now taken the lives of six people. Again, as if nothing had ever happened, Ramon went to sleep. He woke up the next morning on Monday at around 6.15 a.m. In an attempt to cover up the slaughter he had committed, Ramon took paint thinner and began to douse the two bedrooms that had the bodies in them, covering the mattresses and the couch. He then lit a match and set the home on fire. He would then leave the home and go to his job right after. At 6.58 a.m., the call was made to 911 alerting them of the fire in apartment 2D. When firefighters arrived at the location just four minutes later, they arrived at the smoky hallway. They found the door locked and broke it open. What they found were two bedrooms up in flames and the entire apartment filled with smoke. The floor was slippery. The firefighters crawled their way through what felt like a wet surface while looking for people to rescue. One firefighter came upon a man's body. Another found the body of a small child. As some firefighters battled the flames in the bedrooms, others began to break the windows to let the thick smoke out. As visibility became clearer, firefighters started to see that the wetness they'd been crawling through was actually blood. It covered the walls and the floor. In the master bedroom, they would find bodies stacked and the bodies were ice cold. Nothing about this was normal. In a situation like this, the bodies found are normally warm. It was a hectic scene with many workers trying to contain the fire and remove the bodies. The blood on the walls and floor began to mix with the water from the fire hoses, creating slippery pools all over the apartment. One firefighter carried a body out, the body of five-year-old Jennifer. 
he looked down and could see that the flames had burned the skin off the child's feet. One by one, more bodies were found and taken out of the home. They tried to bring some people back. They tried clearing their airways of fluid with no luck. These people had been dead long before these flames got to them, and this was clearly arson. The only question was, who did this? While at his job, Ramon acted like nothing was wrong and worked as usual. He was loading a truck when someone at the job ran up to him to let him know about the discovery made at 332 East. According to co-workers, he was torn to shreds. He cried and acted as if he was in disbelief. But a short time later, after he had left the job, around 10.30 a.m., Ramon could be spotted among the huge crowd that had gathered outside of 332 East. They had just learned about the massacre, the massacre that Ramon himself was responsible for. He watched the aftermath with his own eyes, and as he looked on, he was arrested right on the spot. He was questioned for more than 24 hours and eventually admitted to most of what he had done. In a cold and emotionless voice, Ramon spoke about the moments after he took Maria's life. I sat next to her. I took her hand. It was cold. She couldn't blink. Her eyes were wide open. I spoke to her. She couldn't answer. He talked about stabbing Rufino in the back and using both hands to take the knife out. Oddly enough, he would try to deny killing Maria or baby Linda. He said Maria landed on the knife and that baby Linda fell out of her crib. He also spoke about Billy and Jennifer, saying that he took their lives because they attacked him with a hammer and knife when they realized that their mother had been killed. He wrote that in his written confession. When word of the massacre spread, it left everyone in Spanish Harlem in complete disbelief. And closer to home, police say a fire was set to cover up the massacre of six people in an East Harlem housing project. Two men are being questioned, and as Pablo Guzman reports, neighbors of the victims are puzzled over their deaths. The fire department thought they were responding to a routine run on the second floor of the Jefferson Projects at 115th Street Hall first. They had no reason to believe it was something more. There wasn't much smoke, and the first people they found were still alive. But as they brought people out and cleared the smoke, they quickly found this was no simple fire. There was a lot of blood previous to us putting water on the fire. It was, it was a slippery, and so we knew something was going on. Uh, the bodies appeared to be, uh, for some reason or other, uh, unable to move. They it, it would indicate that with the volume of fire that they should have been able to at least exit or try to get to the door. So. Killed were Maria Rodriguez, 27, and her three children, Bill Getz, 11, Jennifer Getz, 5, and Linda Javier, 18 months. The children's grandmother, Bienvenida Rodriguez, and her boyfriend, both in their 50s, were killed also. All but the baby girl had wounds of various kinds, some from stabbings. The 18-month-old girl may have been killed by the smoke from the deliberately set fire. Uh, well, we have evidence of, uh, of laceration on the head of one of the victims, and uh, it's possibility that some of them may have been garroted. At the time of this report, detectives were questioning someone they would not yet call a suspect. For that, they needed hard information from the medical examiner, and that is expected this morning. From the 23rd Precinct, Pablo Guzman, News 4, New York. In what appears to be a case of twisted love, police have arrested the former boyfriend of one of the victims of the East Harlem Massacre. Today, police say it was a strange tale of love and hate mixed. 28-year-old Raymond Concepcion is charged with six counts of second-degree murder. The police say he killed his ex-girlfriend on Saturday during an argument, then murdered her mother and three of his girlfriend's children, and the following day, he killed his sixth victim. Mr. Lopez went to work that day, on, uh, on Sunday. He returned. There was a confrontation that night where he, he, uh, he assaulted him. Police say after Concepcion killed his victims, he stayed overnight in the apartment with the bodies, went to a Yankee game the next day, and then returned Monday morning and torched the apartment to cover the crime and watched it burn. After a very difficult trial where many new details were shared, Ramon Concepcion was sentenced to 37 and a half years to life in prison for the Spanish Harlem Massacre. Many felt that this sentencing just wasn't enough. I'd have to agree. He'll be eligible for parole in November of 2035. He can be a free man in a few years. And grief spilled out onto the streets of East Harlem today. Relatives and friends tried to contain their emotions at a funeral for six murder victims. A mother, three children, a grandmother, and a friend were killed last weekend, allegedly by the mother's boyfriend. Police say their apartment was set on fire in an attempt to cover up the crimes. It was another tragedy. On Saturday, May 7th of 1993, a service for all six victims was held at Our Lady of Angels Church in El Barrio. 
More than 250 friends and relatives filled the church, while more than 300 others waited outside, filling the streets. The entire neighborhood was grieving. Many wanted to pay their respects to the family after this tragic and senseless event, one that could have been avoided. Onlookers cried and comforted one another as they struggled to accept what had taken place just a week prior. The bodies of Maria, Bienvenida, Billy, Jennifer, Baby Linda, and Rufino were placed in white coffins, and after an hour-long service, they were taken to St. Raymond's Cemetery in the Bronx, where they would be buried. The massacre at 332 East took its toll on the entire neighborhood. Friends and family never thought that it would end this way, but unfortunately, it did. Many tried to get Maria out of New York to safety, but that never happened. She knew she wanted a better life for herself, and this time, she was prepared to stick to her decision. But her monster of an ex-boyfriend had different plans. Like most abusive people, if he couldn't have Maria, he didn't want anyone else to have her either. At PS 109, where Jennifer and Billy attended, the mood was sadness and utter shock. A crisis team was sent in immediately to help children cope with the trauma. Some would try to go on like nothing ever happened, but when questioned about their feelings about Billy and Jennifer, many kids would break down in tears, struggling with the loss. These children who had just been playing and talking to their friends Billy and Jennifer a little more than a week ago were now faced with their harsh and sudden new reality, a reality where they'd never see their friends alive again. One of Billy's teachers struggled with his death, as did his classmates. She had no idea that while she was marking Billy absent for class that Monday morning, his body was being discovered. She looked through old notes and drawings of Billy's, trying her hardest to understand how something so cold and callous could be done to a child, to a whole family. For the rest of Spanish Harlem, the news of the family slain at 332 East left a feeling of emptiness and confusion. It was a surreal feeling for many who had never faced something so awful, especially so close to home. The tale of a woman who struggled to leave her abusive boyfriend was one that many had become familiar with. It was something they had heard many times before, since unfortunately, horror stories about domestic abuse had become so common. But this tragic outcome was a cold reminder that there are red flags, signs that are to be taken very serious, because some situations can escalate to the point of no return. And once that happens, there's no telling who will pay with their lives. Rest in peace to all who lost their lives that day in 1993. And my deepest condolences go out to their families and loved ones. You aren't forgotten.